Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. For announcements, you have a continuation of Lab 10 this week. So this week, you're going to do your demonstration of your infrared remote control tester if you haven't done so already. Um, and then, so the next homework, homework eight, I'm going to move the due date to Monday next week so that you have an extra set of office hours if you want to talk to me about that. Uh, that homework. And then next week, we'll actually begin review for the final exam, because next week's the last week of class. Uh, so if you have any questions during class, be sure to shout out or uh, or shoot me a chat, and I will be around for office hours right after class today, if you want to stop by. All right. So let's continue on with microcontrollers. So last time I left off talking about microcontroller hardware, and I wanted to continue on a little bit with software and how microcontrollers handle number systems. So uh, microcontroller software um, is usually written using some kind of integrated development environment. An IDE is just a uh, piece of software that includes some kind of usually an editor to edit the code. Usually it has some kind of connection to a compiler uh, that can compile the code that gets downloaded to the, the microcontroller and it has other features usually like debugging. So for programming languages, C is probably still the most common for microcontrollers, although C++ uh, is catching up really quickly, if not equal to the usage of, of C for small microcontrollers. Um, assembly language is still available. If you really have to tighten up your code for, let's say, some kind of signal processing routine and the compiler just can't get you fast enough um, or optimized enough. But but I, I, I rarely see this done anymore, but it's still an option. These languages, C, C++, or assembly language, get compiled down to uh, what's called machine code. Machine code is the, the, the binary instructions uh, that the machine, that the processor understands. Okay, so compilers produce this. You probably never write this by hand. Um, I don't know anybody who's ever written this by hand. But the machine code is what gets stored in the program memory, if you remember my block diagram of a microcontroller. So the machine code goes into program memory, and then the CPU of the microcontroller steps through that, that code and, uh, and executes that actual machine code. So you take a compiler, which is a piece of software, to, uh, to convert the C language or C++ language or other language uh, to produce that machine code. Uh, and, and then you use a, a PC and programming hardware to actually download that machine code from the PC to, to the microcontroller. Okay, so you write code on a PC using an IDE, uh, and then you use an onboard programmer, for example, a programmer um, that's available on the Arduino board, or you use an external programmer. For professional development, I've seen it. Uh, it's more common to use some kind of external programmer. This is a, a TI external programmer. There are various versions. Um, there's a microchip programmer. Uh, so the, these are the modules that connect between the PC on this USB side to some kind of interface to the microcontroller JTAG or otherwise on, on the microcontroller side. So you compile the code, and then you download, and you run the code on the microcontroller and debug if you need to. Um, so microcontrollers, generally, once, once they start, they run forever. There's usually some kind of while one loop, if that means something to programmers. In other words, the, the program usually never stops. It keeps running forever until you unplug it. Um, that's, that's usually how these operate. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but oftentimes you don't want your product to stop functioning. Uh, you want it to keep running. So let's talk a little bit about representing numbers in the microcontroller. So this is how you represent integer values in integer data in data types um, that are used by the microcontroller and the compiler. 
So you could see the data type on the left here. So when you declare a variable in C, you have to tell it, well, what kind of variable is this? Is it some kind of 8-bit integer or 16-bit integer, or is, a, is it some kind of um, decimal value called a floating point number? These are common data types. This is an example taken from the Arduino documentation. But, uh, you know, for example, if you have a Boolean variable, right, that's a true or a false, valid values are usually zero or one. Uh, this microcontroller and compiler actually takes eight bits to store one bit. So that's not very efficient, but that's what it does. And, and that's actually pretty common for microcontrollers to do, to use byte boundaries for, for data types. If you only need a zero to 255 uh, range of values, you can use what's called a byte. That's an unsigned value, meaning there are no negative numbers. So a byte can range from zero to 255. 255 comes from two to the power of the number of bits minus one, right? Zero to 255 is 256 values. Uh, if you need signed values in the range of, um, well, eight bits, then you could use a car or a char. That stands for, it comes from the days when characters were represented with eight bit, eight bit values, like a capital A was value 65 and a capital B was value 66. And that was called ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Uh, that, was, that was used a long time ago. And that's where that char or car comes from. Uh, but that data type can represent values from negative 128 to positive 127, right? Those are 256 values if you include zero in there. Um, and then unsigned char, unsigned char is just like a, uh, a byte. It's an unsigned value. That is eight bits. If you need larger ranges for integers, you can use a word or an unsigned word, right? Those are two to the 16th values. Um, and uh, if you need a signed value, here's a signed value here. And then if you need even larger uh, ranges for your integers, you can use an unsigned long, which is what, uh, zero to, what is that, four billion roughly, um, or a long, which is 32 bits and it's signed. Okay, so so when you're when you're programming microcontrollers using C, it's, it's necessary to tell the compiler, tell the microcontroller, what size values you're using for integers. And if you, for example, in a, uh, increment a byte, you define a byte and you have a value 255 in it and you uh, increment that one value or add one to it, it'll roll back to zero. So, so you, you probably, you might not want that. Uh, those are the ranges for integers. For, for uh, decimal values or fractional values, you use uh, floating point. So this is an example of a different microcontroller with a different compiler. This was a Texas Instruments microcontroller. And this used um, floating point for data types that are float double or long double. In fact, these were all 32 bits for this compiler and this microcontroller. Um, so here's, here's how floating point works. So here are 32 bits of a floating point value. The first bit is a sign bit. The next several bits are um, the exponent and to the right are the mantissa. And so the value of that number is expressed as negative one to the power of the sign bit times two to the power of exponent minus 127 times one point the mantissa. And so the range of the, this number is uh, really small to really large. So this lets you cover a very large range of numbers with very fine precision if you need it down for the smaller numbers. So plus or minus 1.18 times 10 to the negative 38th uh, to 3.39 times 10 to the plus 38th. Those are the range ranges that you could cover okay and it's floating point because you don't have a, a fixed radix point like we talked about when we were talking about fractional values um, when we started to talk about number systems so those are the two ways 
that microcontrollers typically represent values, either um, integer values or fractional values using floating point. Okay. So when you're using a microcontroller, so someday, right, in some class project, graduate research, engineering job, you might have to use some simple microcontroller to control something or sense something. It's important to know the input and output limitations of microcontrollers, and you can read these on the, the data sheet for the particular microcontroller or board. So microcontroller input and output ports have uh, limits on voltage and current, and exceeding these limits can, can damage the microcontroller or give you results that you don't expect. So to show you some examples and typical limits, here are the limits for the microcontroller that is on the Arduino Uno board. This is one of the cheap boards that's very common for, um, for people to use, uh, especially in, in, in classes or just to get something working with sensing and control with a microcontroller. So for this, for a five volt supply connection to this, to this board, to this microcontroller chip here, uh, the voltage that you apply to any pin for an input can range from minus 0.5 to plus 5.5. This means if you go out of that range, right, ground to five volts by more than a half a volt either direction, you're gonna get unpre unpredictable results or, or it might damage the microcontroller, probably damage the microcontroller in this case. And then when you're looking to uh, power something or control something from a microcontroller output digital port, the limit here is uh, 20 milliamps on each pin for this microcontroller and 150 milliamps total on all ports. Remember you had a bunch of ports. If you have like 10 ports running on some microcontrollers and you try to output 20 milliamps on each, that's not gonna work because you'd exceed the total output current of the controller. Okay. And so, uh, you know, you might ask, well, what if you have to control something that that is more than 20 milliamps. Well, that's where you go back to what we studied when we looked at semiconductor topics in this class and you would use a, a transistor, right? So now you, so I used an example, one of the, uh, one of the examples I said, using a micro, uh, no, using a, using a transistor as a switch. And I said, off to the right, there's a microcontroller and we'll talk about that later. Well, this is later now. And so this is how you can control high, current loads from a microcontroller uh, that, that actually couldn't provide the current that you would need for that load. You could use a transistor. So if your load needs more current than a microcontroller can provide, one option is to use a transistor just like we talked about many lectures ago in, in this class. So let's suppose you have a load it's like a motor, it's a solenoid, it's a light, it's, it's, it's an actuator, something maybe mechanical that takes more current than uh, just a few milliamps. And then you have this microcontroller that can only output a few milliamps, maybe up to 20. Okay, so what you could do to control that load is use a transistor like we, like we talked about um, in our semiconductors section of this course. So you'd use a resistor designed such that, right, that value would be chosen such that this transistor would saturate and allow the current to flow through that load. So when this um, output digital port goes high, that would cause base current to flow with the right resistor value that would saturate this transistor. That transistor would um, look like a closed switch and that load would operate. So a digital one applied to that port would make the load run a digital zero would make the load stop. And you could even use different power supply values up here. You don't have to use five volts. Like if this is a five volt microcontroller, you could have a 12 volt supply um, controlling or powering that load. And then this transistor contr could control the current from that 12 volt supply through the load while the microcontroller is working at five volts. Right? So all these share a common ground, but you have different power supplies. 
So one common transistor that you have used in class is the 2N3904 bipolar junction transistor. Its maximum current is 200 milliamps. So that gets you 10 times the current that the Arduino microcontroller can output. Um, but 200 milliamps is, you know, it's, it's reasonable, but it's a little small if you want to drive a, a larger motor or a larger solenoid. Um, if you need to draw or control larger currents, uh, you can use MOSFETs. So MOSFETs are metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors. These are devices that, un so, so a BJT is a current controlled device, right? Base current controls collector current. A MOSFET, a field effect transistor, is a voltage controlled device. So a voltage controls the current through the transistor. Um, so we're not going to dig into these, but here's a, here's a common one that's used, this IRFC44N, that's one of the common ones um, that you could use to control tens of amps through a motor uh, using a microcontroller, using only just a few milliamps, actually zero milliamps from that microcontroller because this is a voltage controlled device. Okay, and a, and, a, and a plug for the next course is, it, you know, I'll always offer if you're if you're interested in being able to control larger currents or get it, get into these topics that we just don't have the bandwidth to cover during this course. Um, there's the course uh, next semester, Practical Electronics 4228, I think it is, undergrad and grad, that uh, covers MOSFETs in a lot more detail, so you could get those working. So that's talking about how do you control devices using the output of a microcontroller. How about reading input, for example, from a switch? A switch could be a, um, you know, a key on a keypad. A switch could be a, a, a you know, mechanical switch that's um, sensing the state of a, of a door or a window or you know, anything. Uh, the, the state of a camshaft, for example, a lobe on a camshaft. If you want to read that input, um, one common way to do that is, well, you would connect something to a digital input port of a microcontroller. So this is a, a common way to do this. You, you would connect a, a power supply, uh, the same voltage as the, the microcontroller. So this would be five volts, for example. And this would be a five volt logic uh, microcontroller. And then you connect the digital input port to the bottom of the resistor here and connect a switch between that node and ground. And so you use this pull-up resistor between VCC and the input port so that if the switch is open, the digital input port is always connected to a high value, five volts in this case, let's say. Um, since no current is flowing through that resistor, well, very little current, digital input ports of microcontrollers, just like op amp inputs are high impedance so that you get uh, little or no current flowing into that digital port. So if I have no uh, current flowing through this resistor, then the input port is held at five volts or VCC um, until that switch is closed. And so you use the switch to connect the port to ground. When that switch is closed, the input port is pulled to ground. You get a zero red on that input port. Okay, and, and VCC is connected to ground through this resistor. You get some current flowing to ground through that resistor, but the digital input port is still connected directly to ground. So that means zero volts node voltage. So if the switch is open, the input to the microcontroller would be read as a one. When the switch is closed, you would read the input as as a zero. Okay, so that's that's a very common way to um, connect a microcontroller input to some kind of switch. Again, if you're sensing a lobes on a camshaft with a switch or or, or uh, you know anything really uh, that has some kind of open closed characteristic like a switch. Now, mechanical switches are scratchy devices. They're messy devices. They are noisy devices because you have metal contacts and at a microscopic level, eventually you get down to metal touching metal and um, metal scraping against metal. And so you get noise or intermittent contact 
at, at a very on a very short time frame, very short time scale, as a switch opens and closes. So you could do what's called debouncing a switch. Uh, so a mechanical switch causes this connection fluctuation when they are pressed and released because of the contacts, those metal contacts pressing against each other and then and then separating and maybe there's some sliding action going on there. So if you have the setup that I just talked about and you look at the voltage on the digital input port, when you press the switch, you might see something like this. See, there's not one kind of fall down to zero. Um, you get this, you get this scratchiness, this voltage falling and rising and falling and rising. In fact, when you open up, it looks like this, in this case. Um, when you release the switch, you see these spikes. So if you were counting rising edges, you know, let's suppose that you have a camshaft spinning and there's a switch rubbing against the lobe, lobe and the, the switch is opening and closing. And you want to count number of rotations and you have, um, you know, you're counting rising edges. Well, you would count maybe one, two, three rising edges when the switch just opened once. Okay, and that's not what you want. What you really want to do is find a way to filter out or ignore these extraneous rising edge rising edges on spikes. Those um, th this characteristic of getting multiple edges out of a switch is called a bounce. Okay, and and bouncing can cause the microcontroller to to uh, sense that a switch has been pressed and released multiple times. And there's a simple software approach. The software debouncing approach is you detect a transition from the switch, right? Oh, the switch opened up. You wait a fixed delay. Maybe it's you know a few milliseconds. You test the input again to see if you get the same answer. And by that time, hopefully all the bounces have settled and your, your uh, switch has converged to a, a constant state. And if that input remains the same, you accept it as the new value. Otherwise, you ignore that input. And typically, you you have the uh, delay longer than the expected duration of the bounce, and 10 milliseconds is a common choice. Now, if you have some kind of hardware implementation where you can't program in some kind of software debouncing routine, um, what you can do is actually you can put a uh, a low pass RC circuit like the one you talked about or you you uh, experimented with in lab. You did some measurements on it that that uh, RC circuit will smooth out uh, this transition. So those spikes will actually be filtered out. So that's an option if, you're, if your input port can tolerate a slow rise time. So you might have just a, a time constant of a few milliseconds, and then you don't need to go change the software. Or if you can't change the software, you can do hardware debouncing. All right. Okay, so I mentioned last class that what we're doing here is we're 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 talking about um, uh, microcontrollers at a very high level. I want you to be familiar with them and some of the common problems and applications. Okay, let's see. Someone asks in the chat, what exactly causes debouncing for mechanical switches, or causes bouncing? Well, imagine imagine you have um, you know two two metal contacts and they're touching together. And as you release the pressure, maybe it's spring-loaded, as you release the pressure, those contacts don't stay exactly the aligned and they might do a little sliding, right? So maybe as, as the contacts separate, uh, you get a break in the circuit, but then the contacts move a little bit and on a microscopic level, the metal touches again because this has rough edges. And then it disconnects a little more and slides a little more. So you get a, a break and a, and a reconnect as, as again, at a very quick time scale, very small time scale. And on a microscopic level, you get the metal that is, is um, connecting and disconnecting until the contacts get far enough apart that the, the, there's no chance that any kind of sliding action on that mechanical switch will cause a disconnected contact, pair of contacts to reconnect. Okay, so but that's that's a common problem. If you if you take a, a switch and you connect it to a microcontroller and you just expect a nice clean signal and single counts for each time you hit a button or release a button, you will see that bouncing happen. Some microcontrollers have built in. Uh, what they call Schmidt triggers or Schmidt 
triggers or um, debouncing features. So, uh, so you could check those out too. But overall, um, what I want to get I want to get the sense across that microcontrollers are useful devices. They're not hard to use. They're common. They're low cost. Uh, they're 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 easy to get up to speed on, so that you could you could get a microcontroller development board like one of these, and um, connect it via USB to some free software and do a lot of powerful things with microcontrollers. So out of this class, this is just a survey. So you know that you can program software, you can make them sense, you can make them control. You have peripherals like analog to digital converters, timers to time events or output events like uh, pulse width modulated signals. And um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of power there that where you don't have to, you don't have to have um, months of study to get one of these to work. So I think it's worthwhile covering. But but to take away, microcontrollers are used in embedded systems to sense and measure physical quantities and then to automatically autonomously control systems, right? And embedded systems are systems that are usually um, not meant to be processing systems like your PC. That's where microprocessors go. Microcontrollers and embedded systems are usually not the, the point of the system. They're just used to make the system work in a certain way. Microcontrollers um, include peripherals to implement sense, analog or digital sensing, um, to implement timing, to measure timing, or to produce output signals like digital and analog signals, and, and to communicate. So you could have you can have networks of microcontrollers uh, connected together, or you can have uh, remote uh, microcontrollers talking over Wi-Fi. Um, and you program microcontrollers using software through an IDE, an integrated development environment. Right? That's the software that where you write your code, you compile your code, you download it, you debug on your microcontroller, and uh, you, you interface microcontrollers to the outside world using transistors. There are limitations to the output current and the output voltage and input for these uh, microcontrollers. So you use bipolar junction transistors like we talked about in this class, MOSFETs like we'll talk about in the next class. Um, and also you use signal conditioning like resistors and op amps and capacitors to condition the signal before you take inputs oftentimes into either analog to digital converters or um, digital input ports. Okay, <clears throat> so, so that's the, the section on microcontrollers. I wanna work a, um, a problem here, but does anybody have any questions on basically what we talked about on microcontrollers? Okay. All right, and if you want to talk more during office hours, I'd be happy to chat during office hours. All right, nothing seen, nothing heard. So let's do this. I want to give an example of controlling an LED using logic because since microcontrollers and digital chips can source and sync current, right? Current can go out, that's sourcing current. Current can come into a device, that's syncing current. Um, some, some devices uh, you can control by syncing current and sometimes that's a little confusing. So I wanna give a specific example here. Okay, so we've done this, right? We've done this, we've said, okay, you can take an LED and light up that LED like you did in lab by applying five volts. And this, this LED will light up, right? You design that resistor value so that you get the current that you want through that LED based on its forward voltage and your LED will light up in this circuit. 
So this this is equivalent to writing the schematic like this. Right. If I if I write if I draw a circuit like this and I say I have a five volt node voltage, that implies there's a power supply between five volts and ground, right? If I put a ground here, then these are equivalent. Okay. Um, let's assume we have an LED that we want to either light or not light. And I have two nodes. I have a node here, a resistor, an LED, and then this node at the bottom. All right. And so if I apply uh, 5 volts here and 0 volts here, right? Uh, this LED uh, is going to see a voltage of 5 volts across it with that polarity, okay? or the, the LED and the resistor combination. That, that's just like applying a logic level 1 here and a logic level 0 here. So if I take an LED and a resistor and I connect it to two logic gates and I out output a, a 1, you know, these are 5 volt logic. If I apply 1 and, uh, to a port and I connect that port here and I apply 0 and I connect that port here, this LED will be on. So I'm going to say on. Okay, that's so that's straightforward, I think. If I take that same circuit, the hardware circuit here. Um, and I apply a zero here and a zero here, right? That means I have zero volts here and zero volts here. Okay. My voltage across these two components in series is zero volts. So this LED will be off. Okay, so that you can probably see that. You probably knew this before I, I told you. What's not so obvious is this. If I take that same circuit, and I apply logic level one here, and I apply logic level one here, um, some folks might say, well, yeah, you're applying 5 volts, so this LED will light. And, and you know, plus 5 volts, or a 1 is plus 5 volts here. I'm just going to write that as 5. 5 volts and 5 volts. But if you write a KVL equation, or if you use our concepts from node voltage analysis, what you would find is you get zero volts here, right? I have five volts at the top. I have five volts at the bottom. The difference between those two nodes is zero volts. So I actually have zero volts across uh, this series resistor and LED. So this is off. Okay, so that's really what I wanted to point out. Just because you see five volts logic or a logic level one connected to a circuit with an LED, it doesn't mean that LED is on. You have to look at both sides here. We'll work an example like this too. Okay, any questions on that, on, on why this is off or even why this is on and why this is off? Okay. All right, then let's let's do this. Bring up a slide here.
Okay, let's work a clicker problem here. So you have <clears throat> a logic gate. Here's the logic gate. You have two inputs, B0 and B1. The output of that logic gate is connected to a resistor and an LED. And then the cathode of the LED is grounded. So what values of bits B1 and B0 will cause the LED to light up? All right, take another five seconds or so. Okay, let's call time on this. All right, so we know we want to light up that LED, so we need five volts across the LED and resistor with this polarity. Ground is zero volts, so that means we need a node voltage of five volts at the output of this logic gate, which is an AND gate. We need a logic level one outside of this, uh, on the output of this AND gate. The only way to get a one out of an AND gate is to have one supplied to each input. So the answer is D. All right. All right, let's try another, try this one. What values of the bits B1 and B0 will cause the LED to emit light? All right, take another 10 seconds if you haven't answered yet. All right, let's call time then on this. So we want this LED to light. We need five volts across the pair of the diode and the resistor like this, right? That means we need zero volts on the left side of the resistor, right? Because we have five volts node voltage on the right side of the LED. The output of that OR gate needs to be a zero. The only way you get a zero out of an OR gate is to have two zeros applied to the two inputs. All right, so that's the answer. All right. Okay. So let's do this. Let's do one more example on digital circuits here. Make some space on the whiteboard. We'll switch over to the whiteboard. Okay, let's see if I can get this here. Okay, so here, here's an example. This is, a, this is an example like you would see on, on an exam or homework problem. Um, so I wanted to work through this to, to show you what, what kind of questions could be asked about 
microcontrollers and logic since we're covering these at a very high level. So here's an example of a problem, right? So you have a microcontroller and the microcontroller has digital outputs, B0 through B7. This is one way to label the bits of, in this case, a byte. B0 is the least significant bit, right? The LSB is called, that's what that's called. B7 is the most significant bit, the MSB. And so it, this is least significant because B0 is in the two to the zero power position. And then this is most significant because B7 is in the two to the power of seven position. Okay. Um, let's see, I saw I just missed a question about the LED. Is that about, for, okay, for the second clicker question. Let me do this. Let me bring that back up, that question back up during office hours. If you could stay right after class for office hours, we'll talk about that first since I just totally erased or uh, got rid of that clicker question. Um, but I'd be happy to answer. So, so we want to fill in these values that will control the microcontroller outputs. Those outputs are, contr are controlling LEDs. They're controlling a load that might be a motor or connected to discrete logic gates. These, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Boolean logic gates here. There's a logical multiply going on in a device here. Okay, so we want the output of the microcontroller, this byte, okay, this byte, to do this, we want LED one on. So let's write on, right? We want LED two off, let's write off, right? We want LED three off, there's LED three here, off, right? And the load is powered, what's that mean? That means current is flowing. I'm gonna say the load is on, right? The load is powered, current is flowing through that transistor, that transistor's controlling the current through that load. Okay, so we wanna figure out what does the microcontroller output byte of this port have to be? Okay, all right. So um, let's see, we want uh, LED one to be on. And so we have five volts here on the right we know that current has to flow through this LED in that direction, right? It's the only way current can flow through that LED. We have five volts on the right. That means we need zero volts on the left in order to get five volts with that polarity. And so that will cause a positive current to flow right to left forward through that diode, and this gate is acting like a sink, and right? it's sinking current, it's taking current in. All right, this is a, a NAND gate, so we have to figure out, well, how do we, how do we get uh, zero volts at the output of a NAND gate? Well, if I, if I write the NAND gate truth table, let's see, let's write it, uh, I'll just write B6, B7, and I don't know, let's call this output L1 for LED1, something like that. Um, if I list all possible combinations of inputs for the NAND gate, this is NAND. I'm writing this inside the microcontroller. I didn't really intend that to happen. I'm just using a scrap area here. So this is, oops, I went off the screen, NAND. So, so this table is for a NAND gate. So the only way, so, so the NAND gate is, is not AND. That means that you have an AND gate, let's throw it over here, an AND gate followed by an inverter, right? So you invert the output of an AND gate. So the way to get, uh, so the, va the values out of a NAND gate is to invert the output of an AND gate. So this is the inversion of an AND gate. So that means I need 
to get zero at this point, I need a one and I need a one. Okay. So I can come down B6 and B7, I can put one and one. LED two is off. So I want zero volts across this LED in series with a resistor. So I want a zero here since I have zero volts at the cathode of the, the LED. So B5 is a zero. Uh, this load is powered, right? This load is on, which means I have base current. Right, I have base current flowing into this transistor so that collector current can flow. That means I need some non-zero voltage here at the output, this value C. I need some non-zero voltage. Okay, this is five volt logic. I need five volts here. So that's a logic level one at C. This block here is a logical multiply, which is, that's an AND gate. And the only way to get the output to be one out of an AND gate is to have two ones applied to the inputs. So I have one, one. All right. And then I have, um, Let's see, I want LED three to be off. So I have zero volts on the right. That means I want uh, zero volts on the left of this LED. So I get zero volts across that LED in series with the resistor. So I need a logic level zero out of this OR gate. So to get an output of zero out of, out of an OR gate, I need zeros into that OR gate. So B0 is a zero. So this input to the right OR gate is the output of this left OR gate here. And it's still a zero. I need a zero out of that OR gate. So the only way to do that is to have zeros into the inputs of that left OR gate. So I need zeros here. Okay. All right. So let's see. I have, I have to express the answer in hexadecimal. So we start at the imaginary radix over here at the right that I haven't drawn. If it's not, if a radix is not drawn, put it all the way to the right. We convert four bits at a time on either side of the radix. And so let's see, this is a, uh, a decimal eight right? Two to the power of zero, one, two, three. Two to the power of three is eight. So that's a decimal eight, which is also oh, a, a base 16, eight, right? This here is what, uh, let's see, this is one plus uh, one, two, four plus eight. So this is 13 base 10, uh, which is equal to D base 16. And so you put these two digits together and you get D8 base 16. So if you program D8 into the byte uh, that controls this port of this microcontroller, program in D8, you will get these binary values to show up on the port and those voltages and the LED states and that load state will be as we want it here. All right. Any questions on that? All right. Okay, so uh, we, we almost hit the wall on time here. Uh, so next time we're going to actually start uh, 
one of the well the last major topic of the course which is motors we're going to talk about dc motors how those motors work we're going to talk about stepper motors and we're going to talk about server uh, servo motors um, so we'll start that next time but in closing for this class uh, don't forget lab 10 is a continuation this week you need to demonstrate your infrared remote control tester uh, to the instructors in lab um, homework eight the due date will be changed to Monday instead of this Wednesday, so look for that on Canvas coming up tonight. Thanks for joining class. If you'd like to stop by during office hours, just stick around. If not, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.